In the following decades after the end of the War of the Spanish Succession, the death of Louis XIV and the rise of the Russian Empire, Europe only continued to find itself plunged into great conflicts that would define the so-called Lace Wars of the long 18th century. One particularly recurring theme was the constantly escalating rivalry of the Kingdom of France and the Kingdom of Great Britain, bringing with them their vast array of allies and colonies into an on and off state of war. In October of 1740, the now 55-year-old Emperor Charles VI, the same who campaigned in the War of the Spanish Succession, passed. Charles' only son, Leopold Johann, passed away the very same year, only leaving Maria Theresa in his place. Along the way, she was forced to renounce her claim to the throne. And in 1740, this issue came up once again as the greatest of controversies. To the enemies of the Habsburg dynasty, Bourbon France, Bourbon Spain, and even now, former allies such as Prussia looked to exploit it. Austria was no longer the powerhouse it was during the time of Prince Eugene of Savoy. Wars against the French in the 1730s and the Turks ever since the War of the Spanish Succession's end in 1714 had severely weakened Austria's position as a continental power. More of its electorates, including Bavaria, Saxony, and Prussia, now led by Frederick II, became increasingly confident in challenging Austria's centuries-long hegemony in Germany. France, led by Louis XV, the Beloved, had much interest in further weakening Austria while strengthening its position in Central European affairs. France, allying itself with their newfound German allies in Bavaria, Saxony, and Prussia, declared war. Maria Theresa, having won the support of her nation's provinces, responded by calling for its long-standing allies in the Holy Roman Empire and Great Britain, ensuring a great war on multiple fronts in another unnecessary, bloody succession war. The first phase of the war saw the Austrians in complete disarray. Frederick the Great defeated the Austrians in Silesia and refused to give up their occupation. In Bohemia, the Austrians were defeated by a large Franco-Bavarian army which took Prague in a daring surprise attack led by Lieutenant General Maurice de Saxe in 1741. A veteran soldier with a promising future in the French army. Despite early successes of her enemies, Maria Theresa felt relief when the Franco-Bavarians were driven out of Bohemia by pursuing Austrians after the Battle of Pfaffenhofen, a turn of events which knocked Bavaria out of the war. In 1743, King George II of England landed in Germany with the British contingent of the newly formed Pragmatic Army, named after the Pragmatic Sanction which started the war. George found himself against the Marshals Grammel and the Duc de Noailles at Dedingen. A great battle ensued as Grammel launched vicious attacks against the disciplined British and Austrian infantry before Noailles arrived. British infantry repulsed several vicious attacks and opened up a gap in the French line, allowing for the army to escape, inflicting 4,000 French casualties. In spite of the troubled beginning to the war, the Allies now seem to have turned the strategic situation on its head. By 1744, France had pulled back to its northern frontiers in the region of Alsace. In the north, the newly promoted marshal, Maurice de Saxe, now only possessed around 50,000 troops to defend against a pragmatic army that now outnumbered him by a ratio of 2 to 1. His current opponent, Field Marshal George Wade, planned to capture Lille and used it as a springboard to occupy Paris, similar to the plans Eugene and Marlborough used in the War of the Spanish Succession. This time, the fortress built to defending the frontiers of northern France had deteriorated since the days that Marshal Vauban built them. The War of the Spanish Succession left many of them beyond repair and useless in the defensive plans of de Saxe. However, he wasn't a passive commander and harassed Allied operations tirelessly in the region, always keeping Wade off balance to the point where he could no longer effectively command the Pragmatic Army. A French officer commented, The greatest mistake the Marshal could make was to actually capture Wade. Indeed, Wade never reached the walls of Lille. In the winter of 1744, he left for Antwerp 
where he requested to be relieved of command. After searching for their candidate, King George chose the Duke of Cumberland. Cumberland previously served as Colonel of the First Foot Guards and then Lieutenant General in the British Army. He served with distinction in the Battle of Dettingen, where he received a musket ball in his right leg, and his contemporaries thought him to be a brave and capable man as well. That year, he was made Captain General of the Pragmatic Army. In France, de Sac spent the winter reorganizing French forces on the frontier. In 1734, he climbed up to the rank of Lieutenant General. In 1741, at the Austrian Succession War's outbreak, he masterminded the daring capture of Prague with few losses. He had a reputation as a drinker and a womanizer, but proved incredibly able nonetheless. England also relied on a staff of veteran officers, Sir John Ligonier and James Campbell. Both fought with distinction under the Duke of Marlborough in the War of the Spanish Succession. The Dutch contingent took the field under Carl August Friedrich, Graf of Waldeck Pyrmont, also serving in the same past conflicts as his peers in French, Prussian, and Imperial service against the Ottomans. As Waldeck was foreign, his appointment as commanding general of Dutch forces was controversial in the Netherlands. Lastly, leading the Austrian contingent was Joseph Lothar Dominic, Graf von Königsegg Rothenfels. He distinguished himself in the Battle of Turin in 1706 as a general, and in other battles against the Turks. Once the Austrian Netherlands, now modern Belgium, was created, he was appointed to command Austrian forces there as field marshal. And with the staffs of both armies filled, the dramatic campaigning season for 1745 finally began. And already the Allied campaign began to show cracks. The Dutch were, previously, particularly hesitant on siding against the French, as in 1744 neither country had declared war on each other. The Dutch ally, Britain, failed to field any troops to aid in the defense of the barrier fortresses, which the Dutch fought so hard for in the War of the Spanish Succession. This served to further divide the interests of the British and Dutch. But in the end, to the Dutch, their interest in defending their barrier fortresses in the Austrian Netherlands prevailed. De Saxe was likely, after all, to target them regardless. Secondly, Cumberland still had yet to sail for Brussels, leaving the pragmatic army headless. De Saxe took advantage of Allied complacency and began campaigning earlier than normal. The pragmatic Allies agreed to assemble their forces in Anderlecht for Cumberland's arrival. A good point to cover any advance by the French and maintain a line of communication with England, Austria, and the Netherlands. However, this did not sit well with Sir John Ligonier and Waldeck. Both wanted to move as quickly as possible and engage de Saxe. Koenigsegg, being the deputy commander to Cumberland, maintained his stance on remaining in Anderlecht until reinforcements and Cumberland himself arrived. And soon, he did finally arrive in Anderlecht. After taking careful consideration of the differing viewpoints of his staff, he decided the best course of action was to march on Mons, where de Saxe had last been reported. Cumberland's generals were under the belief that the Marshal possessed no more than 30,000 men to defend France. In reality, both pieces of information were purposefully spread by de Saxe himself, fighting a war of misinformation to deceive his enemies. Third, the British senior officers and Cumberland himself could not conceive of the idea of being beaten by the French. Overconfidence left over from the Battle of Dettingen, where they were trapped and came out with a victory willfully forgetting the fact that the Duc de Gramont attacked too early. Lastly, the Allies continued to fall for de Saxe's campaign of deception. De Saxe had been diagnosed with a terrible fever that affected him for the rest of his life. He exaggerated the severity it had on him on purpose. In reality, de Saxe would not let such illness deny him command on the field. To the perspective of de Saxe, his deceptions were working well. And they were. De Saxe successfully drove the Allies towards Mons, but his real target was the city of Tournai. He did this by threatening Mons and Charrois with a fainting detachment under the Comte d'Austray. De 
The Marshal himself completed assembling his army at Montbouche, and then left for Tournai on the 24th of April. With a rapid march, masked by smaller detachments and under the cover of thick fog, his forces trapped Tournai on all sides by April 26th. Meanwhile, Cumberland assembled an army of 21,000 British, 22,000 Dutch, 8,000 Hanoverians, and 2,000 Austrians at Brussels. 53,000 men in all. First reports rushed to Cumberland, stated that de Saxe was to attack Mons with only 30,000 men. Koenigsegg stood by his plan of defense while the barrier forts held out. The Dutch and British still advocated to as soon as possible overwhelm the French in a pursuit. These arguments costed the Allies a crucial week of campaigning. Cumberland ended up agreeing with Waldeck and Ligonier. But even more contradictory reports arrived to Cumberland. Now they were saying that the Saxe had abandoned the siege of Mons and marched to a destination unknown. Then even more news arrived that a French army encamped itself around Leutz, Ath, and Tournai. Misinformation became so widespread that even when solid evidence of Tournai's envelopment came, the Allies shrugged it off as another deceptive tactic from the French. It was another few days until Cumberland realized he had been outmaneuvered by de Saxe and finally began his march to the Scheldt River in order to relieve Tournai in open battle. De Saxe's plan caused Cumberland to fall right into his hands. With the time the Allies had been delayed by, de Saxe had spent his time constructing a defensive position where most of his army would be located. He knew that Cumberland was seeking out a battle and had to lure him into a ground of the Marshal's own choosing. De Saxe ended up choosing the village of Fontenoy with a neighboring Antoine. Around the towns, he placed the smaller detachments under Generals Luteau and Lowendal to detect any differing movements from Cumberland, and defend both of his flanks. This allowed him to quickly react to any dramatic change. And luckily for de Saxe, the Allies were still of the belief that he possessed only 30,000 effectives, and were determined to find him. For my own part, I cannot believe that the enemy will wait for us. Notwithstanding, it is assured that the French king is at Lille, if not at the army. My reasons are that they might have disputed our passage hither, and with great advantage of ground. That they have withdrawn their baggage across the Scheldt, and not thrown up earth to form a circumvallation. However, I cannot say that everyone is of my opinion that the enemy will retire. I cannot come to any certain knowledge of the enemy's numbers, but I have concurring information that the body on this side of the Scheldt does not exceed 31 battalions and 32 squadrons. Earl of Harrington, British Army. By the 8th of May, de Saxe finalized the deployment of his army at Fontenoy. Not long after, Austrian hussars finally found the real French army they had been after for months. Now it was only a matter of time that Cumberland walked into the trap. Throughout the 9th and 10th of May, Cumberland gave orders to clear the pickets occupying the outlying towns and roads at Vaison, Peron, and Bougon. The advance units of each allied wing formed up 18,000 men, an unnecessarily large number to clear what was no more than about 100 or 200 Frenchmen. Not to mention the movement was slow and rugged, as torrential rain bogged down the allied advance. But before the 10th was over, General Campbell arrived at his new headquarters in Vaison. After he arrived, he received reports of Frenchmen in large numbers in the Bois de Berry, or the woods of Berry. He was recommended to clear it before any Allied advance took place. Fearing a flank attack if one was to go forward, Cumberland acknowledged this finding, but failed to act on it as he reconnoitered the French positions for himself. That night, when Cumberland returned to discuss their next move for the 11th, most of his staff fell in favor of a general engagement. The Earl of Crawford suggested that a sizable British division be sent to the Bois de Berry, but Cumberland thought differently. He believed the Bois de Berry too dense to house many Frenchmen, 
Secondly, he was too occupied by the idea of capturing King Louis or the Dauphin that came with him. Such a thought was too tempting for him to let go of. Gradually, as the rain dissipated, the final council of war came to a close. Cumberland then told his staff, Tomorrow at 2 a.m., the whole army will move to the position which detachments occupy today, and will form an order of battle in the manner which generals will find the most suitable, having regard to the ground over which they may have to maneuver, after which the army will march on the enemy. Duke of Cumberland, Captain General of the Pragmatic Army. That night on the opposite side, French gunners pre-sighted their guns as Allied soldiers slept. De Sachs knew Cumberland was about to walk right in into a plan of his own making. And in the early morning hours of the 11th of May, the Allies struck their tents and stood to for battle. The two Austrian Freikorps companies made their way into the Bois de Berry to provide flanking cover. To the Allies' luck, a great fog concealed the positions for the Allied army. The Allies would need to hurry their men into position for it was not to last long. Muddy ground, ditches, and orchards caused the men to slip and stumble as they ran to formation. While the rest of the army prepared for battle, the Austrians stumbled upon the Arquebusier de Grasson, an independent light infantry unit that fought in loose formations. The skirmishers on both sides took the skirmishing order and engaged one another under heavy fire, firing the first shots of the day's battle. Cumberland, hearing the gunfire, ordered the creation of an ad hoc brigade to sweep aside any Frenchman in the woods. The Dutch Waldeck Regiment was the first to go in and outflanked Grasson's men. Pulteney, Semples, and Buslager's regiments answered the call as well. Outnumbered heavily, Grasson was compelled to fall back at 4 a.m. with slight loss. Not long afterwards, Cumberland had rode in front of the army, ordering the Allied flag gun to begin firing signaling the army to advance. By firing the flag gun, Cumberland knowingly gave away the element of surprise to the French, and the terrain difference which separated the three wings of the Allied army would make it unable to coordinate together. Waldeck's Dutch contingent, with the most open terrain to advance on, would find itself destined to march on the French first. Waldeck's intended orders were to attack the longest and most thin line of French infantry in de Saxe's right flank. It was defended by several brigades of infantry as well as three artillery redoubts. On their flanks were the villages of Fontenoy and Antoine, the former defended by the four battalions of the regiment Piedmont, and the latter defended by the regiment Dauphin, with the four battalions of the regiment du Roi in reserve. Waldeck did not have enough men to take either village. Instead, he would attack the redoubts, cutting off the French brigades at Antoine and Fontenoy if successful. Waldeck, not realizing that the anglo hanoverians had yet to step off, began a general advance at 5 a.m., marching under the thick cover of the morning fog. As the Dutchmen inched closer, they were met with sporadic fire from the French artillery. The cover of fog for now protected them from serious losses, but in time it would burn out. At this same time, Ligonier and Cumberland agreed to delay the advance of the right wing to clear the Bois de Berry. It is unclear if Waldeck had any knowledge of that decision. Minutes after the advance began, open fire on the readouts. All this barrage served to do was reveal the Dutch gun line with their muzzle flashes only triggering a response from the French gun line. Meanwhile on the Allied right flank, sudden fire from the French left alerted Cumberland. As he created an abrupt meeting to reassess the situation, reports from the Austrians informed him of a French artillery redoubt on the outskirts of the Bois de Berry, one perfectly in position to enfilade a British advance. Not only that, but Grasson's skirmishers returned. But for the ad hoc brigade commanded by General Inglesby, no advance was made by him until 6 a.m. Inglesby requested artillery support from Camp Bell before he would make a move. Unfortunately, Camp Bell was able to send three six-pounder cannon to the Bois de Berry. But back at Vaison, the fog began to lift. French gunners from the redoubts and Fontenoy 
then took the opportunity to fire at the British lines, now in full view of their guns. Campbell felt a breakdown in discipline. Without any word on Ingoldsby's situation in the woods, he ordered an advance of his horsemen to screen the British infantry. Within minutes, Campbell was felled from his horse by a cannonball. Both of his legs were shattered and had to be carried away on a litter as the advance stalled. His injuries proved fatal. Allied guns fired grape shot into Grasson's men to drive them to the edge of the wood line. It had little effect amongst the vast amounts of trees that Grasson's troops utilized for cover. It was only a matter of time before Grasson had sent the redcoats reeling back from the Bois de Berry. Three Allied guns prompted counterfire from the Chambonnet redoubt. Already, the battle seemed to come close to spiraling out of control before it had begun. Ingoldsby had retired his brigade while the three six-pounders counterbarraged the guns of the Chambonnet redoubt. Shaken, the brigadier was no longer able to utter coherent orders and remained in the shelter of Vaison with his men. Cumberland rode by and confronted him with a hot temper, telling Ingoldsby exactly what would happen if he did not obey the commander-in-chief's command again. The fighting in the Bois de Berry ceased as the cannon fire slowly dwindled for another two hours. Both sides needed time for their guns to cool down and be washed of old powder. Waldeck took the opportunity to advance once more with a seemingly decreased risk of advancing under heavy fire. His contingent split into two divisions, with his own leading the attack on Fontenoy. The other, under General Kronstrom, would attack the line of redoubts. But by now, the fog here was beginning to clear. The French infantry had been deployed in line along the earthworks and fortifications. Other companies were deployed in buildings that they could provide fire support from, allowing the maximum amount of firepower to bear down on the Dutch when they would close in. And closed in, the Dutch did. As the blue-coated Dutch came within musket range, a great cry of Vive le Roi, or Long Live the King, erupted from the French line, as well as a massive barrage of lead from their muskets and cannon. Scores of Dutchmen fell dead on the first impact. Next, the French artillery provided an enfilade fire, meaning they fired upon the Dutch from their front, flanks, and even their rear. The initial carnage was so apt that the attack immediately came to a halt, as the Dutch ran as quickly as possible to any cover they could find. The rush was so wild that battalions pushed into each other, so close that Kronstrom was accused of trying to form his men to do square. General Casimir von Schlippenbach, a Dutch cavalryman, was particularly horrified by the breakdown in discipline of the infantry. They remained inactive allowing themselves to be subjected to the hail of cannonballs, rather than make even the slightest attempt to carry on the attack. General Casimir von Schlippenbach, Dutch Army. Some even ran all the way to the city of Ath to bring news of defeat. Lieutenant General Halbe provided further testimony and wrote, I saw whole regiments, which despite all previous signs of steadfastness and bravery, nonetheless remained immobile, without direction, as if immobilized by fear, and others whose actions are nothing but shameful, notably a colonel and a major who rode from the battlefield at the head of two squadrons, no doubt fleeing for Mons or Brussels. Lieutenant General Hobe, Dutch Army. At Fontenoy, Waldeck's men managed to actually close in with the men of the regiment d'Enfant and Beauvoisie, trying to break the fishhook of de Saxe's army. Fighting was desperate. With his flanks now open, Waldeck advanced his second line into the fighting. But without support from Kronstrom, the Dutch dithered into a stalemate. Unable to break through into the village, General Luteau, leading the right wing of the French army, managed to keep his men engaged. With Kronstrom's division in danger of being wiped out, Waldeck sent a message to Cumberland himself, stating that he would attack once more if given the chance to reorganize and the Dutchmen reeled from Fontenoy. The Dutch attack had completely collapsed.
Our approaching troops were so received by the French infantry that they fell completely into chaos and were thrown back. It was only with numerous threats that we were able to bring even a small number back into a semblance of order. Unknown Dutch officer on the Dutch attack. With the collapse of the Dutch attack, de Saxe's planning and positioning of his army survived its first test with flying colors. The failure was caused by an underestimation of the French resolve and positioning, as well as the failure for Allied commanders to coordinate their attacks. At 9am, Sir John Ligonier now effectively led the Anglo-Hanoverian wing, pulling back Campbell's cavalry to enable his infantry to finish their deployment. This came at the cost of losing some men to cannon fire, but thought it a necessary evil. Cumberland gave up on clearing the Bois de Berry, believing it to be too treacherous to capture, and that the French wouldn't exploit its advantages to full extent. Instead, he figured the battle would be decided upon a withdrawal or renewed attack with the British Hanoverian support. He had reason to believe that it would work. British drill and discipline could and had been relied upon to win many a great battle in the past. To him, it would not be so different this time. And so, he ordered Duror, Semple, Pulteney, and Waldeck's battalions to be moved in position for another attack on Fontenoy. Ingoldsby was struck by a cannonball and killed, so command fell to Hanoverian general Ludwig von Zastro, ordered to reposition next to Sol's brigade. Ligonier then halted his deployment to allow for the arrival of General Lewis's 29 cannon to deploy in front of his brigades. They returned fire against the French artillery and quickly silenced them. They also killed the French general of artillery, the Marquis de Brocard, and the Duc de Gramont, leading the Guards Brigade in the center. All occurred by 10.30 a.m. Minutes later, Ligonier's brigades had completed their deployment. On the French side of things, de Saxe had refused to ride in a carriage for his poor health. Instead, he spent most of the battle in the saddle. He expected the Dutch attack on Antoine and Fontenoy, but not for Cumberland to give up the Bois de Berry so easily. He did know that the British Hanoverians were about to hammer his strongest concentration of infantry in the center, however, and to remedy any breakthrough, he had previously placed two lines of cavalry to their rear under the Comte d'Estray, with both the elite gendarmes on their right and the Maison du Roi on their rear left, guarding the King and the Dauphin of France. From there, they watched the battle in relative safety. De Saxe had earlier been congratulated on the repulse of the Dutch infantry, but he responded to the celebration by pointing at the anglo hanoverian columns. Look yonder. There are the British, and they will be a far more difficult meal to digest than what we've had been served so far. From the French center, de Saxe thought he had seen on his right wing what were reforming Dutch troops, but left General Luteau to watch them as he believed him to be more than capable of repelling a second attack. He then ordered the Duc de Biron, General of the Brigade du Roi, to instead take charge of the Guards Brigade in the French center. As these men were dispatched, another rider rode up to the marshal, informing him that what was Ingoldsby's brigade formed up for a renewed attack in the center, and so he took the advice with consideration. Back at the Dutch lines, Waldeck concluded that in order to successfully break Fontenoy, he would need to do away with the divisional system, and instead concentrated his forces into combined wings. He himself lined up the battalions of the regiments Alva, Constant Rebec, Sally, Stirler, and the Blue Guards, while Kronstrom led the remainder of the infantry. Mountain troops on both flanks were to screen the flanks of the infantry and charge when the time came. Aiding the Dutch in a renewed attack would be the Hanoverian Brigade, along with British battalions of Semple's 42nd Highlanders and Durore's regiment. These troops were expected to assault the northern end of the village. Back at 10 a.m., Waldeck signaled the advance to Kronstrom after Allied artillery began a great bombardment. Kronstrom's battalions, to Waldeck's frustration, did not move. 
frightened by the salvels from the French guns. He was replaced by the Duke of Schomburg Lippe, but Lippe himself was just as indecisive. Reluctantly, they eventually stepped off, but as cannonballs crashed into the shaken ranks of the Dutch, part of the attack already fell into complete disorder. The Dutch cavalry attempted a frontal attack to reinvigorate the assault, but the horsemen were peppered by French muskets. The Dutch troopers once again scattered in confusion. The Dutch contingent would play no further role in the battle. And just as Luteau's men had repulsed the final Dutch attack, the Anglo-Hanoverian Brigade launched their assault onto Fontenoy. Colonel Monroe of the 42nd Highlanders distinguished himself at the head of the regiment. As they advanced and orders from French officers from Fontenoy rang out, he ordered his men to duck in cover, avoiding the French fire, with only himself still standing in front of the regimental colors. He would be handsomely rewarded for such bravery after the battle. Then rising to their feet, the Scots became the first to charge the village. They paused on the lip of the trenches, fired a volley, and then smashed their way into it. Savage bayonet fighting broke out between the men of the 42nd and the men of the Regiment des Dauphins. One Highlander reportedly struck a Frenchman down nine times with a broadsword before having his own arm blown off by a cannonball. Monroe also did not realize the second line consisting of the Regiment du Roi was above them. Duror's regiment then engaged in a grim melee with the Beauvoisie regiment, initially having better luck. Duror, like Monroe, led from the front with great courage. But their luck ran out. A single battalion from the Regiment du Roi countercharged the Scots, relieving the battered Delphon brigade. Colonel Duror himself was then struck by a cannonball that shattered both legs. He was carried to the rear with his claymore in hand. At this point, holding on to their local successes became too difficult, as the battalions of the Regiment du Roi inflicted huge losses on the Scottish regiments. Almost all the Scots officers were now killed or severely wounded. One of the remaining officers, also severely wounded, ordered a retreat as the most senior officer in command. The Scots were thrown back in disorder. As for the Hanoverians, they too plunged themselves into close quarters fighting, but they too suffered dearly under murderous volleys and countercharges. The entire attack was doomed from the start. The courage of the Frenchmen and the poor performance of the Dutch led to another disastrous, bloody repulse. Luteau had held once again, but he knew he could not counterattack as his men were entirely disorganized. The Anglo-Hanoverian assault had been so furious that he spent the rest of the time reorganizing the village to repel more assaults. Louis XV visited the French trenches. He was recorded to laughably insist the artillery crews take spent Dutch cannonballs and return them to the Dutch. He had no wish to retain such gifts. But while the French right recovered from the second attack, the most iconic part of the battle had yet to rage in the center. Cumberland, deciding not to cut his losses and withdraw, handed orders to Ligonier to launch a grand column into the French center, to break it and split the French army in two, hoping to trigger a French rout. Ligonier swiftly pulled back the grand battery placed in front of him, and so, the huge column of redcoats marched off for the beat of drums at 11 a.m. in one of the greatest advances of the 18th century. French round shot fired into the ranks of the British had been halved. French only now had eight guns remaining at both Fontenoy and the Chambonnet redoubt. The British and French guards brigades advanced within 80 paces of each other before halting. As the redcoats halted their advance, Lord Charles Hay, captain in the first foot guards, walked out of the ranks. He doffed his hat and bowed, raising his hip flask into the air to salute the French and Swiss guardsmen, and then took a long drink. He urged them to stand and fight, not to flee like they had done at the Battle of Dedingen two years earlier. Hay then turned back to his regiment and had them give three cheers to the enemy. One private knew what Hay was to propose and sarcastically said, for what we are about to receive. Suddenly, the Comte d'Entourage, grenadier lieutenant in the French guard, 
took to the divide of the two battalions in front of Hay. Lord Hay then shouted, Gentlemen of France, would you care to fire first? Reason being that the first volley was the most carefully conducted and thus the most effective. Not wanting to be outdone, Antaroche refused and asked the same to the English. Before any further exchange, a random musket fired from the ranks of the French guard, followed by several more until the whole line erupted into a ragged volley. Its effect was minimal. The British then responded with a much more effective volley. After the first firing, they double-timed through the smoke, calmly reloaded, and fired twice more. The French guards, still reeling from the first volley, were cut to shreds. An estimated one in four guardsmen, 700 in all of 5,000, fell from the vicious volley. Soon, the entire first line was in disarray. De Sacks had local reserves from the second line fill the new gap, but even the regiments Abateur and Crillon suffered a terrible fire, bringing up the frontline casualty number to 1,200. They too fell back in both directions in complete disarray. Cumberland had just witnessed his foot guards break the French elite in just a few disciplined volleys. Emboldened by a storm of confidence and with no dissent from Ligonier, he decided that continuing the advance would carry the day and earn him a famous victory. All that stood before the British infantry were the two lines of cavalry. The British Grand Column once again dressed its ranks and pressed onward slowly. But unlike Cumberland, who preferred to get lost in the details by joining Ligonier personally, de Saxe was careful to lead from an acceptable distance. Seeing his guards be thrown back in terror, and that the village of Fontenoy had repulsed the second assault and needed precious time to recover, he only had the option to plug the gap starting with his first line of cavalry. At best they could throw back the enemy, at worst they would buy enough time for more infantry to be brought forward. Next he ordered issues to the French left, ordering the Irish Brigade, otherwise known as the Wild Geese, to make a right wheel onto the column's flank, a maneuver that would also take time to coordinate. He also waited for the arrival of the Count of Lowendal with his cavalry detachment, which would take even more time to arrive. Time that de Saxe was unsure if he had. And so the first line of cavalry under the Comte d'Estrée was thrown forward. The British ranks, still slowly advancing, undaunted by the now minuscule cannon fire, were in the midst of redressing ranks when a cry of, Where cavalry? echoed through the column. Then the movement of thousands of hoods could be heard. The French cavalry were approaching. The British battalions then halted, raising their muskets at the mass of horse flesh before them. Bayonets glinted in the sight of the French horsemen. When the French cavaliers came within 50 yards, the entire British front line erupted in flame. Like a scene from Agincourt, many Frenchmen and their horses fell. Those remaining milled about in front of the British and fired their pistols, scoring a surprising amount of hits on the British ranks. Despite some losses, D'Estray did exactly what was asked of him, and halted the advance for at least a precious moment. However, as the British reloaded, the French cavalry retired. Keeping them there, disorganized in front of the enemy, would only serve to sacrifice them for no real purpose. The attack gave precious time for the Brigades Royale and Coronne to be marshaled into position. Ligonier did not perceive this to be much of a threat though. His brigades had beaten the guards after all, and moved forward once more. In the meantime, Brigadier General Tomon placed three of his Irish regiments, anchoring on the redoubt de Chambonnet. The Royal Vaisseau reformed and formed the second line. Satisfied that the situation was seemingly stabilizing, de Saxe rode off to meet with the king to offer a report. Yet when he arrived at the headquarters of Louis XV, he met with a number of subordinates begging the king to flee the field and avoid capture. De Saxe, dismounting his horse in pain from illness, then said, Which of you gave his majesty that piece of advice? It's unsure of what he said exactly, but it was certainly language fit for the gutters of Paris rather than in the king's presence. Wanting de Saxe to take over the talking, the marshal gave the king a telescope and pointed out the British juggernaut before them. 
and then the regiments that had posted meet them, as well as what were signs of the French and Swiss guards reforming to redeem themselves. Louis looked to the Maison du Roi and Carabiniers that waited orders, and considered giving de Sac's permission to commit the elite cavalry of France. Back to the center, by 12.30 p.m., the French had gathered 22 battalions. Some rallied from the first volleys, to face all flanks of the hanglo hanoverian column. Furthermore, near the Oi Redoubt, the Normandy regiment with its four battalions arrived on the field and were incorporated into de Sac's plan of attack a column which now resembled a hollow square to cover its flanks. The advance of the column greatly slowed due to a now increasing barrage of artillery fire. But without orders, the Comte d'Apture, with his cavalry regiments, charged into the western face of the Allied square, hoping to earn fame as the man who broke the Allies. The cavaliers boldly charged, but were cut down by musket fire. However, the Dragons de Noailles managed to break into the ranks of the Third Foot Guards, almost sending them away in disarray. But in a stunning display of courage, the British managed to hold their ground and send the last of Apture's men back to the French lines. These reckless attacks that the Sacks hated about the French army only served to further delay his plan of counterattack and rack up French casualties. By now, General Luteau had taken command of some battalions facing the British. Both de Sacks and Luteau noticed the British stumbling upon their own dead, as well as French dead to advance further. Noticing this, de Sacks this time actually gave the order for Luteau to press forward and attack, to give himself more time to organize a defense. Placing himself at the head of the Royal Brigade, General Luteau pointed his sword forward and shouted, Charge! The French infantry bravely advanced and were met with a belching of fire from the British muskets. Despite the disciplined fire of the Brits, they managed to reach within bayonet distance. In several minutes of brutal melee, the French were compelled to retreat as they found no way to break the column. Only minutes after their first charge had fallen back, the French Carabinieri Brigade had thrown themselves forwards without orders after having been placed closer to provide a rallying point for the French infantry. But as they approached, they too had many of their saddles emptied by disciplined fire. Then they were forced to retire back to the line. It seemed like nothing could stop the British column, and many in Louis XV's entourage once again begged him to retreat. Believing in de Saxe's ability, and seeing that his plan had yet to unfold, he refused any request to flee and stayed with the army. De Saxe was convinced that the invincibility of the British column was only an illusion, one that could and would be broken. Despite the reckless, unordered attacks of the Carabiniers and other cavalry brigades, and the failure of General Luteau to break the column at any point, de Saxe's men had managed to grind the column's advance to a complete halt. And finally, the Count of Lowendal appeared on the field with the regiments Auvergne and Touraine, as well as additional cavalry, including the cuirassiers. A welcome addition if the enemy breaks or if their cavalry is ever committed. And now, the Irish Brigade, along with the regiment Normandy and others, fully deployed themselves for de Saxe's counterattack. Lowendal rode ahead of his detachment to de Saxe, who embraced his dear friend. The marshal cried out, This will be a fine day for his majesty. Those people there, they cannot beat us now. On the opposite side, Kurnisek joined Cumberland and Ligonier. As a man who saw action on both wings, he took note of recent events. Following the failed attack by our left wing, the enemy threw his strength against the British, who already endured severe losses. Eventually, their lines could no longer endure this heavy fire, and their lines began to waver. But the Duke of Cumberland, through his courage and presence of mind, rallied them, and once more led them against the foe. Dominic von Königsegg Rothenfels, Austrian Army. However, the failure to neutralize the defense of Fontenoy and the Chambonnet Redoubt came back to bite Cumberland in the rear. His men began to suffer severe losses against the combined arms 
of French grape shot and musket fire. Richelieu's enfilade took its toll. And finally, de Sax found the moment he had sought after for hours. A little after 1 p.m., he dispatched orders on all sides of the Grand Column. The Brigades du Roi, Royal, and La Caronne began their attack on the Allied left, while the Comte de Lowendal dispatched orders to the wild geese to charge on the column's right. The French guard redeemed themselves and followed the Irishmen, as did the Normandy regiment. The wild geese crashed into the British guards. They were recorded to have chanted, Remember Limerick and Saxon perfidy, in reference to the broken treaty of 1691. Bulkley's regiment managed to capture a standard of the second foot guards. A grim melee ensued, which saw the British be forced back one step at a time. During the Great Charge, a French lieutenant, possibly from the Regiment de Normandy, took note of the bravery of the Irish. We advanced and came across three of our Irish battalions, who were being badly handled by the enemy, but our approach fortified them and they renewed the attack. To our front stood six enemy cannon, and we had no choice but to charge them head on, even as they fired upon us at close range. In less than four minutes the enemy grape shot had killed or wounded close to 16 officers and 250 men. This failed to stop us, and as we overran the guns, we forced the enemy to retire. To add on to this charge, the elite cavalry of France crashed into the British ranks triggering the square to collapse in on itself. Having been beaten by the same infantry they so easily swept aside before, the Allies quickly fell back in a panicked rout. Onwards, destroy them, said one French cavalier. Only the Allied cavalry in the rear would save the pragmatic army from destruction and caused an orderly retreat. Cumberland's retreat to Ath was emotional. Cumberland's anger at the underperformance of the Dutch sowed division between Allied generals, a divide which affected them up to the end of the war in 1748. That night, as the French investigated the battlefield, littered with bodies, echoing with the screams of the dead and dying, King Louis traveled the field with his son, the Dauphin, showing him the cost of military glory. The toll of Fontenoy was immense. The French suffered 6,000 to 8,000 men killed or wounded, but for a much larger estimated Allied cost of 10,000 killed or wounded, as well as 2,000 prisoners and 40 cannon. At the headquarters of Louis XV, de Saxe rode up triumphantly to His Majesty. He carried with him Anglo-Dutch prisoners as well as captured British standards. He raised his arm toward them in the air and triumphantly proclaimed, Your Majesty, I give you victory. On the 19th of June after the battle, Tournay surrendered to the French army, marking their first conquest in the Flanders campaign. All this occurred while Cumberland's army retreated northward of Ath, hoping to rest, resupply, and destroy the divide that now plagued his staff. Within the following months, the important cities of Ath, Boudinard, Ghent, and Bruges would fall into French hands. Many of these captures were done by complete surprise, laying the springboard for future operations in 1746 and 1747. The Battle of Fontenoy cemented Maurice de Saxe as a Marshal of France and a legend in military history.